is I'm going to uh, take you through um, a set of notions, ideas, concepts that you use in your industry every day and then move on into how these are connected to design rather than start with design and then let you figure out for yourself what these things mean. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to use the word design very often. I have uh, structured uh, all this information uh, so that you don't feel as if uh, you are shortchanged because you don't know design because the whole idea is to understand design and move towards it. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm also going to do it very commonsensically, no jargons, nothing, just very, very commonsensically. And uh, if I had more time, I would have uh, uh, elaborated with uh, names of uh, you know, players, etc. But uh, there are enough names for you to go and uh, figure out. So the contours of it are all there. I'm going to start with a Nokia case study, uh, which was a, a premier European company in the 90s into the mid 2000s. Uh, its fall from it, it rose meteorically, and then its fall from grace took just a decade. Um, you wonder what happens to huge companies like this in 1990, in 2000. Nokia sold its billionth handset to a customer in Nigeria. In those days, a billion really meant something. Today, with all the scams, they don't mean much, right? But a billionth, ha a billionth handset in the hands of a Nigerian meant that their global reach, outreach was huge. It wasn't just the European markets. We also know how Nokia became a torch. It was a sturdy phone. It, it had great uh, you know, empathy with uh, people and not necessarily the Blackberry types. But uh, its fall from grace, all the things that it did right, it did right. But its fall from grace happened for a single reason, which is that Nokia failed to observe changes, uh, failed to uh, uh, undertake um, game changers and uh, you know basically changes that have a par paradigmatic um, uh, impact on the ecosystem of the particular industry, in this case telecommunication. Uh, the game changer that it failed to notice was the shift of the function of telephony, which is telephoning, to its and, and its extension into computing and social networking. So very soon, people weren't, weren't using the cell phone. And I'm talking about the 2000, OK, not now. They weren't using the cell phone just to make telephone calls. They were also using it to make emails and social networking. And of course, these things happened a little bit earlier than we did over here. So uh, let's see what, what very briefly what this, uh, you know, what this involved. Uh, the success of Nokia in the 90s uh, was hailed, as all successes are hailed, by the, you know, by the, by not just the biggies in the industry. When the leaders of geopolitical formations come and start hailing, that's when you know your companies reach somewhere. So, you know, the head of uh, World Trade Organization or the head of, uh, you know. Uh, a World Economic Forum. These are the people when they get to know, and st like for example, the way today today's newspaper talks about uh, America for um, through you know for the acquisition it made uh, with the steel company there, but uh, hailing Tata for the jobs it managed to create um, at that level. So it, at, a, at a geopolitical level of recognition. In the case of Nokia, the ultimate recognition came when. The head of European Commission, which is now called European Union, the head, Romano Prodi, uh, actually uh, cited Nokia as an example of, um, you know, uh, example of a company that was able to create a lot of clusters and, in the process, create uh, through startups, create a whole, you know, lot of uh, different companies. All that happened because of Nokia. Uh, in the process, Nokia was able to actually recharge a lot of uh, ecos different ecosystems, not just of Finland, but uh, ecosystems that reached into Italy, into Greece, into Spain, into Portugal, into Ireland, and 
the names that come automatically to my tongue are the names that have actually faced financial collapse in recent years. And Nokia is cited to be a company that if it had seen the game changing, it might have helped with keeping these you know, economies uh, floating afloat. So um, the thing that it misread was this uh, shift. The reason it misread was because it was being headed at that time by its CEO, um, Oli Pekka, whatever, Kailas Vo, doesn't matter, who used to uh, look at uh, his, his idea of success was to uh, make sure that you hang on to market share and uh, not necessarily look at uh, innovative products. Today it's a lot more, uh, you know, passe to talk about innovation, innovative products. But in those days you looked at market share, you looked at, you know, sales figures, you looked at all of that. And so, um, so it failed to actually integrate its telephony into these, uh, you know, into computing and social networking and ultimately, um, Nokia dis literally disappeared from uh, public consciousness. Now, uh, that brings me to this idea of innovation, right? Everybody talks about innovation. But what is not usually uh, pointed out is that innovation is an inevitability of nature. And by nature, I don't just mean forests and trees and all that. I mean nature of man and nature of human as embedded in the ecosystem of everything else where to survive you need to adapt and to adapt you innovate. So innovation is not something that was introduced by uh, post industrial revolution technologies. Innovation was always there. We, we had fire because of innovation. We had shoes because of innovation. We had clothing because of innovation. Now we, so basically we innovate to survive and uh, you know survive the changes that are wrought by time. And of course, as they say, change is the only constant in life. And to adapt to change, uh, when we innovate, it's good to remember someone like Francis Bacon who says, he that will not apply new remedies must expect new evils, for time is the greatest innovator, which means experience. Uh, now, when you're innovating, it's not, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, the word is used, uh, you know, uh, rather too frequently. It's not that simple a thing. It's, it's, a very, uh, it, it's a very commonplace part of our lives, but it's not that simple. Uh, it's like money. You know, you have money, but not everybody is wealthy, right? Uh, the thing about innovation is to be able to anticipate, not, and then build something through which the change and adaptation becomes an easier proposition. Now, while you're, uh, the reason why people don't, First of all, it requires a skill of anticipation, but the reason why people uh, don't venture out to change or to innovate is because they're afraid of mistakes. And uh, Steve Jobs, the I resign Steve Jobs guy, says, sometimes when you innovate, you make mistakes. It is best to admit them quickly and get on with improving your other innovations. Because uh, it is not about being a stroke of genius or something. You, you know, where innovators are usually portrayed as geniuses, but actually uh, behind an, a single innovation are a lot of failures. And one of our students from uh, the mid-2000, mid who is now a household name, Pranav Mistri, came and showed us some stuff recently in the month of March. Um, and he showed us like stuff that just didn't work and stuff that worked. And stuff that didn't work was like a lot. And stuff that worked was just one or two. But when you show those one or two and you go, ha, ah, you know, like, I did not get it right. I have a lot of stuff piled up there which didn't work. However, it doesn't mean that when you innovate, you take needless risk. You know, you, you, for example, Warren Buffett says, I don't look to jump over seven foot bars. I look around for one foot bars that I can step over and then you move incrementally. So when you move through risks, you move through incrementally. When you look at ideas, you go exponentially. So these are some of the basics, and I know that you know these basics already, but I just thought I'd articulate for you so that you know we are on the same page. Now, um, let's uh, connect uh, someone like Oli Pekka, Callas Wu or whatever, with somebody who's suddenly been catapulted to attention. Uh, this happened yesterday. 
can you that's a, that's too obvious a, obvious uh, an example to give a uh, clue to give can you tell me who might end up being like the nokia ceo as against somebody who wasn't like nokia ceo yes indeed the the reason why the market crashed by whatever points it did was because it was tim cook and um, they say he's a dollar and cents guy whereas steve jobs is like a product visionary and yet with hands on on design so you wonder how a vision and hands on you know work together and we'll discuss that that's the whole thing about a design good design process that you're able to integrate the two so the product visionary usually looks at information laterally which is a combination of laterally is not just strategic it's a combination of strategic and uh, tactical strategic is high level tactical is details a uh, dollar and cents guy looks at information vertically and therefore merely tactically so he's just kind of moving through hoops which he can see he doesn't want to see a lot of hoops ahead and uh, he, he 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 can get it wrong whenever there is this uh, game changer thing happening you don't observe you you get it you you don't observe so long as the game hasn't changed you're okay and you think that's going to go on forever so that brings us to a much an oft used um, word called lateral which if you read edward de bono you'll you know you'll be swimming you know up to your gills with lateral so i'm not going to get into that but uh uh let's look at another way to understand the idea of lateralization so this is like a pre lateral uh there is uh, this innovate uh, if you i'm sure you some of you know uh, hiroshi she just wanted to ask a question how many of you are students here oh so uh everybody working yeah okay so um so you would know some of these names uh hiroshi ishi of mit media lab the ways of approaching problem solving uh solving is via technology where the question you ask is what uh you look at technology to solve your problems basically look at problem solving to the prism of technology so that that means the available technologies or the emerging technologies become your scaffolding for problem solving um, as a result you experiment with technology it's a kind of combinations and you arrive at a solution uh, the technology assumption here is that these outcome will grow along with your habits and eventually become part of the human domain the second prism with which to look at problem solving is applications the question to ask with applications is where and basically harnessing technology uh, uh, by applying it into other sphere applications hoping that one or the other will work and uh, the assumption here of course is that you apply what you already know so technology and application although they sound really fashionable words tech and app are not really the game changers they are actually scaffolding to game changer the game changer is actually a very common place word but difficult to understand is reasoning hiroshi says that um, when you do when you approach problem solving through reasoning you ask the questions who and how sublimating the questions uh, what and where of technology and application uh, reasoning means you need to understand who you are talking about knowing full well and recognizing that there is no one size fits all you know that and uh, technology usually tries and makes solutions into one size fits all so also applications that's why one starts when you use reasoning one starts with recognizing no, by recognizing that this is what technology and application does you start with this complex proposition of who which is man and his ecosystem which is the ecosystem of the problem which could then include non humans which is animals plants etc it's a misnomer to think that everything is human centric that's the other thing if you're in culturally mediated uh, geographies like india africa brazil etc to take an hci approach would mean actually approaching things through human uh, through technology and once you've taken who as your main proposition you begin to brainstorm the particular aspect of this complex proposition and uh, 
you try and understand what are we currently faced with because the who is not going to tell you what his problem is. You have to figure what his problem is. Who knows what works? Who doesn't really know what doesn't work? By the time who realizes what doesn't work, it could take years. By that time, it's too late. An innovator will look for what doesn't work in the who and ask questions. And who is human being? You ask questions to elicit what is not there, which is not like advertising. In advertising, they try and create artificial wants. So, so this is a really difficult proposition. This is the real one. This is the real McCoy. You really need to understand what he or she wants. That is the process that we're going to try and undertake. Uh, the assumption here, of course, is that uh, technology and application will not give you those answers. And the primary assumption that you need to take is that this is far more complex than technology and assumption uh, and, and uh, applications. So uh, the, having given you the bad news about uh, lateralization, let's come to uh, something a little more exciting, meaning something that you've probably read in uh, in different uh, books. One of the books that I will suggest here as I go along is Robert McManus's Right Hand, Left Hand. Now, we come back to the idea of lateralization. So lateralization is essentially problem solving. It's, and what does it suggest? It suggests a certain way of the brain functioning. Lateralization lets the brain move between high level and low level and taps into the right, left side of the brain to secure its understanding, the understanding of a problem, uh, to secure uh, the following ingredients of understanding of a problem. The analytics, so the right, so the, so the left side of the brain works well uh, with uh, the functions of analysis. Uh, it, analysis usually works discreetly, which is this bits, you know, discrete as D-I-S, C-R-E-E-T-L-Y doesn't work analogously. So you, you, it basically cuts down things. It becomes reductive, and you don't need to see the big picture, the forest for the trees. And uh, uh, it requires a linearity of movement. Therefore, temporal sequences, sequencing is important. It facilitates the understanding of language and mathematics. Because both language and mathematics work discreetly. If you look at Sanskrit grammar, it's one of the most mathematically derived uh, grammars of the different language systems. The right side of the brain uh, looks at things holistically, synthetically, and organically. By synthetic, I mean f factors that are sort of fused together, and you see this one whole picture. There could be a lot of confusion. If you're not good with uh, dealing with confusion, you could you know, mess this thing up. But um, basically, there's a sense of information diffusing organically, not discreetly. Uh, so therefore, it allows you to also be creative. Uh, you don't have to answer. You don't have to account for those right away. You know, diffuse, diffusion or diffusiveness is where you can sort of, you know, the, the, the boundaries are not clear. Uh, so that's why when Picasso did uh, Cubism, he did not have to explain analytically what it actually meant. With time, we understood what Cubism was, uh, which was basically putting in elements of a theme uh, through a set of lines, points, and um, you know, plane. Uh, the right side of the brain also has this fantastic ability to process input simultaneously, because if you're going to be diffusive, you are going to have to be simultaneous. It has a fantastic ability to be visual spatial, unlike the mathematician and the linguist. And it has this fantastic ability to recognize patterns and faces. So most designers are actually right side gifted. Most organizational, organizational people, managers, etc., left side gifted. And there are very few who are gifted both ways, which is Steve Jobs. So therefore, he can do both hands-on and uh, product envisioning. And it's not fair to expect most people to do all that. So if Cook can actually keep the company afloat and bring in designers and strengthen his design team, uh, then uh, Apple should be OK. Now, why is it so important at the present times to be lateral and innovative than it used to be before? Suddenly, everybody's talking about innovative and lateral, right? even engineers. It is because changes on the ground uh, 
today are far more difficult to anticipate than changes on the ground were before uh, be because there is very fast pace of technology and all. Basically things are not driven by technology anymore. You think that they are driven by technology and machine, it is a lot easier to anticipate. It is when human beings take over, it is a law of the jungle, you know. Uh, so there is a there is a lot of chaos, but there is a method in madness and companies have to figure how to understand behave, how to sort of sieve out the behaviorals and put them into an order, which is what we are going to do. So you think that you are going to uh, compromise design, but uh, you do understand from what I am saying that design is not just about sitting with a paper, pencil and you know going all poetic and you know some vague drawings. It is not that. You have to be able to process your information. And uh, if you are designing for yourself, like your own firm, it is okay. But if you are doing it for a very large setup, then you also have to learn the skills to communicate those, which is called visualization, the skills of visualizations. Now, uh, the four major factors that have changed uh, uh, things rapidly in the last decade, just a decade, and which have called for new rules of engagement with design and innovation are the following. Uh, speed of communication, the sheer speed of communication. What has that done? It has uh, shortened our attention spans and it has introduced new notions of engagement. For example, in Facebook or email, you know, you, you, can't, you, you can't just wait. You, you have to just get on with stuff. You are fidgety, you are, you know, you are like, oh shucks, this does not work or this, you know, this sucks, etc. So if you are, so your mind begins to, you know, the brain starts working in, in a certain speed. And uh, people expect that kind of speed. So first is the speed of communication. Second is the spread of communication. As if speed of communication is not enough, we have another complexity which is spread. And the complexity that, that, that spread in turn introduces, and of course spread of communication through networking technologies, etc. But the complexity that it introduces is twofold and opposite, diametrically opposite to each other. One, that through networking technologies, you are globalized. And so you can go across, the world becomes flat, you know, as Thomas Friedman said, and you know, you can, you can work uh, at your computer and see the whole world and all that. And everything looks the same because, you know, you can, you know, the same rules of engagement will guide what's happening in the United States and what's happening in India. And so you think, okay, good, I mean, then what's the problem? But the more you travel, the more you begin to look at local factors in a heightened manner. You know, the contrast becomes severe. So if people over there, for example, yesterday's um, uh, you know, uh, news said that the more affluent that Americans are, the less they care for their parents. Now, is that, uh, is that conceivable in our country? Unless, you know, I'm this horrible, I'm just this horrible person that I don't want to care for my parents. The more affluent you are, the more comfortable you'd like your parents to be, right? Yes or no? Right, no? But over there, the more affluent you are, the less you care for your parents. Now, when you go globalized, is that something that's going to get globalized in economies like in cultures like ours? That's not possible, right? So you, when you read that, you realize, what is it that I do and what is it that I don't want to do? That's just an example. For example, weddings over there are a very private affair. And over here, it's like, an occasion when you call people who've helped you, you it, the, the wedding ceremony, uh, you know, uh, uh, caters to a lot of things. The marriage between two individuals is just a uh, reason, just a, you know, just incidental. You do a lot of things. You say all the people that have helped me have to be invited. All the people that I like have to be invited, etc., etc., etc. So uh, localization and globalization unfolding at the same time and that has implications for problem solving and for, and for uh, deployment of technology. Thirdly, is a very, very important factor. I'm glad that I'm able to say that today without having to explain too much, which even some months ago I had to explain, is the democratization of our means of production through the democratization of technology. And what's the example of that currently that's happening? Right. Some time ago, and if, if, you, if you read, you know, if you watch your television, you know, news channels carefully and read the papers, you know that for months together, uh, Kejriwal and others sat and actually strategized how to put forth, you know, uh, let people know about this. Because everybody is bothered about corruption, but what it means to actually 
go forth and give enough support is what happened through the networking. And of course, you know the example of Arrow Spring. So, uh, if, if I said that some months ago, I mean before the Arab Spring, it would be inconceivable for people to think that actually millions of people can come out on the street and accomplish what m m newspaper magnets weren't able to accomplish or governments weren't able to accomplish or dictators weren't, weren't able to accomplish. So what does this do to the things that actually affect problem solving and designing? Uh, things like the things that get spread and shared our information, publishing, innovation, and uh, basically these start moving downwards into the individual and the co community level, goes out of the hands of multinationals, and it becomes, you know, crowdsourcing, etc., crowdsourced, etc., and basically viral. So you can no longer control the way innovation is going to move. So the task of anticipating it becomes even more difficult, and therefore the, therefore the need for you to lateralize. And lastly, the intangibility of resources because of the virtual medium. So it's so resources that are that that are intangible and yet shared are knowledge. That's that's why we are sitting in a knowledge economy. Spectrum uh, that drives communications, hospitality that drives the service sector, media that drives governance and entertainment, social media that drives human interactions and communication. So. Uh, What does this, uh, uh, you know, this seems passive because this is, what, this is what we do, but even five or ten years ago, this is not what we were doing. What were we doing five or ten years ago? You guys are young, so you may not remember because you weren't working then. Five or ten years ago, everything worked on lesser speed and therefore the, because things had to be physically transmitted, so the rules of engagement were different. Uh, uh, there was less intercultural movements. So you could ignore uh, geographies that did not uh, cover your markets, and that is what happened. The West, you know, the companies basically looked at uh, markets uh, not only that had demand but had affluence. And then when the West sort of got saturated, they came to sell and they didn't know how to deal with it. And uh, 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 thirdly, you know, resources were mostly tangible. So organizational resources was, you know, it was controlled by people who had capital, and uh, you know, organizationally that was a different ball game and not within the reach of individuals or communities. And lastly, information often remain hidden and opaque. And you know what that can do. That is actually a block to innovation. So um, the net outcome uh, that has implications for design is that today, context is king because of localization. And because context means people, not machines, not technology, not assembly line, but people, you know that the next level of people means communities. That, that's why your design and in, in, in innovation actually community, you know, centered, community driven. And community means the, you know, recognizing the, that the common man has a say. And that finally shifts the spotlight uh, effectively from the common man to the user. So that's what it means to be with the user. Now, this shift of focus from uh, the machine to the user happened in the late 80s with the arrival of not the networking technologies, those hadn't yet come, at least not in deployment. That happened with WWW in the early 90s. But this happened with, uh, you know, uh, the uh, technologies like rapid, the, the you know, legacy of rapid prototyping and tooling, technologies where machines could connect up and, you know, you could do, um, you know, inventory and all that remotely. So. Uh, once that happened, uh, basically control moved away from a central, uh, you know, place to, uh, to federated spaces. And once that happens, then you know that uh, assembly lining reduces, sometimes vanishes, and uh, the focus then shifts from uh, large organizations uh, to smaller organizations and large products to smaller, smaller scale products. So a good example of this is IBM versus Apple uh, Macintosh in the mid 80s. Now, there are, now this is where the whole, uh, you know, the whole sort of complication starts that you're sure now that you have to deal with the human. And I know that this, the, it gave rise to this field called human computer interaction. Uh, 
and uh, you know um, uh, lots of different uh, theories and terminologies, etc. But HCI kind of they actually appropriated a term which uh, extends to a much larger domain. Human computer interaction is basically the interrelationship between man and machine. And this was something that was being explored at the Xerox PARC through the 50s and 60s. Most of the innovations around the world today, whether definitely at Microsoft and Apple, were innovations that actually took place in the Xerox PARC. You know that uh, Jobs pulled out the mouse and the uh, GUIs out. Exactly. And Xerox PARC had people like Bill Buxton, who is now principal researcher at Microsoft. Uh, Ray Ozzy, who's the head of Microsoft, the you know uh, uh, the, the the Steve Ballmer section, not the research. Uh, Alan Kay, who's with the university. Um, some of them are no more, but you just named. And in fact, there are uh, there was a big um, you know there was a big uh, IPR problem when Steve Jobs actually pulled out stuff from Xerox Park and did not give adequate um, uh, credit to uh, uh, Steve Wozniak and others. Those are, those are other matters, but uh, way before the arrival of HCI, things like things that were happening at Xerox Park were basically stuff that s computing technologists were trying to mirror from human behavior because they had reached a dead end with no solution. So the main domain at that time was artificial intelligence. And um, Artificial intelligence basically was uh, indirect manipulation. So you had to build a lot of codes to understand the machine. Uh, and that was not working out. You know, it was too cumbersome. So after many years of uh, you know, research and you know, pondering over, they realized there's a, this uh, pioneering person called uh, Douglas Engelbart, at, under whom Buxton and others had worked, realized that uh, the most, uh, the, the, the easiest, uh, ex the, the example of easy translation of words and language is who? Is human beings, right? We just speak and you understand. Of course, you have to learn a language. But even before you've learned a language, you can understand a baby. Because a baby doesn't just use words. The baby uses different uh, you know, gestic gesticulations, etc. Person with another language, if you go to France, for example, you can shake hands and kind of figure out things, right? And there's common you know, words like niet or you know, pa and stuff like that. So they actually uh, took what is called hermeneutics, which is the interpretation of language in linguistics, and used hermeneutics to build natural language, the natural language ability of humans to build natural language ability into computing, and came up with direct manipulation. That's how we have direct manipulation with our computing systems, which is simply to say that uh, HCI was not pioneering in understanding the relationship between computing and machine. And uh, Xerox Park had this very sound understanding, a very large level understanding of this relationship. So having said that, uh, let me just come down to, uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can read up a lot of that stuff, but I just wanted to introduce that idea. Having said that, let's come down to this idea of local milieus, the whole, you know, the whole complexity coming out of localization and human, uh, you know, having to deal with humans and local milieus. And, uh, uh, and this idea of having to be rooted. So how do you get rooted to, uh, rooted to the human? You do it through understanding local ecosystems. And an ecosystem basically has stakeholders. It has a certain kind of environment. And it has certain physical uh, you know, collaterals through which you actually absorb information. Uh, you do this, actually, through you do this by understanding the way people look at the world. Because if you presume, if, if I as a designer or an innovator presumes how you look at the world without really talking to you, I wouldn't get it right. Because human beings are very complex. Each one is different from the other. And you need to. So what you do is, but then you cannot go to each and, each and every person to understand. You know? So you, you do a high level thing by talking to people in depth and then collating all that into personas. So you come up with different kinds of personas. You collate information and say, OK, these are the different ideal types around which I need to work, and which, which give me a fair idea of what the problems are on the ground. So you're basically approaching problems through the user and the user's view of the world. So it's, if, if, if my problem is to be solved, you need to understand how I look at the world. And 
world view, it is, you know, world view in, through our particular view of the world, we construct our ways of decision making. So, whether you, 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 dis, you know, the decision to become a criminal, for example, comes from the criminal's world view that, you know, he thinks that it is a shorter way of, you know, getting wealthy and so that is his world view. There is no value judgment there at this point in time, it is just that that world view is a very important thing to look into. World view is not just about philosophy, world view is actually, world view and ecosystem are how western companies do their problem solving these days. So, we will try and understand what that is. So, let us come back to Hiroshi Ishii's suggestion that in a people centric world, what works best is reasoning before technology or application and reasoning alone will unfold world views which is basically as I said a collective, a collective of ideas and notions that each individual constructs about the world around him. In other words, the way we view the world and in the process act and make decisions. Now, ultimately we come back to why we were trying to understand innovation, is not it? Which is about problem solving, which in today's world requires the need to anticipate human behavior and actions on the ground and which can or must be understood through the point of view of the human looking out into his part of the world, which ultimately becomes, which is basically his world view of a given problem. So, these terms are understood, right? I mean, you use these terms all the time. So, the, the interrelationship of these terms, I hope, are clear. clear. When you uh, actually get on to problem solving, you employ a certain process that embraces all these parts of the problem solving. Uh, you know, the, if you want to solve problems, you need to actually go through all of this, uh, which actually lays the responsibility of understanding a problem squarely on the innovator and the designer, not on the user, right? So, there is this beautiful saying by uh, a German, uh, actually an innovator. He says, a bird does not sing because it has an answer. It sings because it has a song. You do not solve a problem because you think there is a problem. You solve a problem because there is a problem. Advertisers solve problems because they create problems. Eventually, advertising is considered to be a bit of a fluff, right? Because advertising is light hearted. I mean, it is light weight also. They do not solve the world's problems. So, obviously, real uh, problem solving uh, has to, uh, when, so, so when you do real problem solving, how do you know it is real problem solving? In a real problem solving situation, the uh, a clue to whether you have picked up the right problem is when after you have solved it, the noun of the solution becomes a verb. So, you Google, right? Googling, I, you know like you Facebook, you Google, the solution becomes your everyday usage. It is like I eat, I drink, I do that, I Google, I Facebook, right? You do not say I IBM. Right? You do not say I big machine, I, you do not say those things, right? Uh, so, you Google, you Xerox, you know, you, you know, like Godridge lock, it became, it is not as if only Godridge made locks, but the Godridge lock was so good that it became generic to our, you know, understanding of the lock. So, sometimes you say, oh, Godridge or Godridge cover, like Godridge mein rakh dena. Means what? I mean, it means nothing actually, but you know, in traditional houses, say, teen Godridge hai, waha pe rakh, isme nahi rakhna, usme rakhna. So, uh, and of course, the recent one being um, I am Anna, this deep identification which will tell you that you are spot on on the problem and the problem is spot on solution. When a solution is not spot on, it will be called a solution. So, do not be happy if your solution is called a solution. That means, it has not got integrated with human beings. When it gets integrated, it takes on different names. Uh, now, um, just a very, you know, very, very quickly, I want, to, I want to take you through how in an age of information, we um, uh, apprehend information and process information. Now, this is important because all of this is happening. We are in an age of information. So, all problem solving will have to come through information processing. But uh, I hate to burst the bubble. You know, there is uh, there's this um, innovator called Douglas uh, Robertson, Douglas S. Double S. Uh, Robertson came up with this paradigmatic idea about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more, 
where he said that we are not in the first age of information. As long as human beings have been around building, even before civilization, just surviving, human beings have been in the middle of information, right? So what were the, except that each, each information age used a certain kind of dominant tool and a dominant mode of communicating and transmitting information. So we are actually in the third age of information. The first age of information revolved around uh, writing. So when speaking was no longer enough, because through speaking you can't archive. It's only through writing you can archive. When information became a lot and you needed to archive, you needed to come up, you needed to develop something through which you could archive. And that's how writing got developed. Then when it was no longer enough to contain writing because you needed to actually very quickly pass on information across large, you know, geographies and, you know, be able to, you know, transmit information fast, you came up with printing, As especially through the Bible. You needed to, you know, because in those days uh, Spain was actually, uh, Spain and Portugal were colonizing uh, all kinds of continents and Bible was the first thing that was printed anyway. And then when it became clear that that was not enough because, you know, when you print, the information gets static. You need to go back to information, correct it, and, you know, do it at, uh, you know, uh, uh, jet set speed. That's when came computing. So we are actually in the third age of information. If you take that as your background of how information, now if you, if you say we are in the first age of information, then your benchmark for any information gathering will start and end with computing or with the machine. And you will fail to actually draw lessons from our earlier styles of uh, communication. Which is what? Which is using sensories, right? Uh, right now, when you use computing, m most of what you use is your hands. Of course, now it's getting wearable, it's getting ubiquitous. But Bill Buxton said around uh, about, about 20 years ago that if, and he said it with a lot of uh, solemnity, you know, he said that if the earth were to dissolve, you know, through a meteor or something, and human beings were to crash and civilization were to crash, and then you had an alien come down and uh, look at the human being, then he would think that the human being had, the way he would construct the image of the human being would be that the human being had large, huge eyes, no legs, large fingers, almost no shoulders, fairly big elbows, large lower limb, almost no upper limb, almost no torso. Why? Because that's the way you use the computer. The affordance that you've given to your body while using computing takes away the need for you to use all other parts of the human body, nor other sensories of the human. Now it's different. Now you're trying to introduce, you've introduced voice, you've introduced, you're introducing tactility, you know, gesticulation, you're introducing all of that. But when Buxton was writing, it was just text. So if you don't use something, that something is going to go. And if we are still here with our five sensories, it means that we use them in our everyday communication and in communication that's meant to actually facilitate other factors. So it is a mistaken notion to think that in an age of information, this age of information is only about computing. It will never be just about computing. Computing will soon vanish because Intel chips themselves are kind of vanishing. There's another replacement. So you don't know what's going to come next. And then you'll say, why did I make so much of computing? Because ultimately what will remain is how human beings use the sensory. So human beings actually at the very first level, at a very primordial level, use their sensory to process information. Uh, whether you're a baby or an adult, you will use a sensory. But as you grow older and as you are uh, exposed to artificial information, the artificial information is actually derived cognitively by processing your brain a conscious processing of the brain. And between, so, so the very early basic form of communication, which is sensorially driven, moves over to socially driven uh, information because, you know, children and others, you know, make friends, etc. And then as you grow older, your social networking increases. But oftentimes it sort of, you know, tapers off because you're using a lot of your cognitive skills, depending on what kind of job you're doing. But it important. It's, it is when it comes to cognitive skills that the right side, left side issues become uh, uh, big because uh, it determines how you process your information. When you're physically, you know, you're using sensory, you're not analyzing. 
you do things intuitively. When you're doing, when you're socially networking, you're not really analyzing. There's a lot of intuitive uh, capability built into those forms of communication and transmission. So it's important to understand these when you're actually <laughs> building solutions. If you say my solution is going to be this device driven by computing, then you're going to have a flat solution. If you keep all this in mind, it becomes more complex, but it's also more challenging. And also it allows you to understand the human being better. Uh, especially when you have to go to rural milieus where there's no computing, you have to ask what is it that they use every day to, uh, you know, to communicate. Now, uh, so uh, I'll just quickly introduce one more person called Marshall McLuhan, who was actually the first person, and this was in the 60s, to connect our sensories, the five modes of sensory, with technology, the particular technology that takes the sensory, you know, the information from this sensory and communicates to others. So he used the word media, which is basically plural for medium. And uh, he said that it's a little bit like Googling and, you know, the verb noun syndrome. If, if a media is closely connected to the human, the media will no longer remain just the technology that allowed you to transmit information or gather information it will become the message itself. So then the medium becomes a message. So today when I send a birthday greeting, a lot depends on, you know, you, you'd say, oh, what did she do? What did she do? Did she send me through Facebook? It's no big deal because you know the date, right? Email, okay, she remembered. You, know, you call up, you say she took the time. And you come to meet with flowers and that's the ultimate, right? So it matters how you do. The medium that you use becomes the message. So McLuhan and Robert Robertson sort of changed the way we look at information and it's important for you to understand because these have sociological and psychological dimensions of understanding uh, people. So how does design organize all this information for problem solving? The two major things that design does. Uh, first of all, uh, design uh, tries to lateralize information which is basically being able to cut across not similar categories of information, but dissimilar categories of information and information in absentia. So a designer or someone with left side, uh, you know, right side abilities or somebody with the ability to lateralize will actually look at a problem and look at what's not there and then try to join up the dots. And that's how you come up with innovative solution, which is what Jobs did, right? Because he said, why do you have to use the keyboard to, you know, music and keyboard have nothing in common. Whereas when you circulate something, you know, like you, you, know, you, you play the tabla or you, you know, play the tanpura, you, you, you use your fingers. And you, you just use your fingers in very different ways, like the disc jockey. So there's a very close connect between music and using fingers, or music and, of course, listening. So the input device, he thought, should be, uh, you know, the, the, the input, input capacity should actually be not uh, texting, but turning things around. And that's how you had the iPod. It was simple, right? Just quite simple once you see it. But he actually, you know, he dared to actually see this. He dared to say, well, well in those days they said, how can you not have the computer and the keyboard? It doesn't look like a computing thing. But uh, if I converted the keyboard ability, and I don't need the QWERTY in any case to, uh, you know, if I, if I want, uh, you know, if I want uh, Mick Jagger, and I do M I C K J A G G R E R, all that's not needed, right? I mean, I could do it through icons. I could do it through just shifting and saying, OK, from, I go from rock to something, from that to something else. And then you shuffle and things like that. And you get your music. And that permutation, combination, and playfulness is actually associated with music. After all, you're not researching, you know, it's not like academics. So it's all right to make a few, you know, mistakes, not get it the first time, and, you know, you get it eventually. Now, that's lateralization. Key to lateralization is being able to see missing points. So if you come up with a pat solution, it means everybody's also going to think along those lines. You go out of the box to think of something, you know. Out of box experience, OB, is where you dare to think something that someone else hasn't thought of, not because you want to be different, but because it needs to be thought of. And the user, uh, you know, there's this whole participatory design and all that. Please remember that Boeing and others are into participatory design today. 
uh, Philips, etc. But Philips says that the consumer, the user can never be the designer. You can only ask for suggestions about their problem. You have to convert the problem into ideas. You think that the consumer comes up with ideas? No, because a consumer can only see what's there, right, and how that works and how that doesn't work. But the consumer cannot see anything beyond that. It's for the designer, the innovator, or you know, visualizers to see that. So this is fine. This is fine. You you figured the missing points and you sit down to design. But it's very important to get the missing points from out there because you're joining, you know, you're sort of dotting the T's and you're joining, joining, you know, spots that others can't see. How do you make others, that is others in the organization, see those spots? For that, you have a very, very, you know, very, very exciting and complex set of tools which come under the broad category of visualization, which you've done already, right? Basically, uh, visualization allows you to take uh, components of the problem as you see it. You have, you know, that is your liberty. And uh, convert it into images and join up the images through certain, you know, semantic, uh, you know, uh, consistency to uh, pose them as maps or diagrams. And uh, through that, you then, then you apply your analytical skills to it and see how you can shift, shift shape the diagrams to arrive at a, you know, possibilities of problems, uh, uh, solutions. Mm -hmm.